In this video, we're trying to talk about biological influences on sex, but what I think is really important to note is that when it comes to human sexuality, it's almost impossible to talk about biology without having some social influence involved. Culture plays such an important role. All right, so first things first though. Um, we know that our chromosomes play a huge role in human sexuality in terms of actually bringing about our biological sex. So our 23rd pair of chromosomes, known as the sex chromosomes, determines our biological sex as male or female. We get one copy from mom and one copy from dad, and if the combination is an XX, we become a biological female. If the combination is XY, we become a biological male. So essentially, the Y chromosome is the key to becoming male because mom is definitely going to pass on an X chromosome in her eggs and dad is either going to pass up upon um, in the sperm an X or a Y. All right, so Y become male, X you become female. Um, all right, so kind of just a quick side note, I think what's really interesting is um, biologically speaking, males and females are essentially the exact same, anatomically speaking, for the first six or seven weeks of prenatal development. But at that period, about seven weeks after conception, if there is a Y chromosome, that flips a testosterone switch, which starts the development of the testes, and that begins the release of testosterone in significantly higher levels, bringing about more of um, you know, a male anatomy as opposed to female. All right, so of course there's, you know, that's all biologically influenced. But there are always variations. And here's what I think is really fascinating, again, that we often think of um, our sex as male or female, XX or XY. But researchers have shown that that is not always the case. There are plenty of examples of intersex individuals. For example, you can have um, people born with an unusual combination of sex chromosomes. So for example, um, a, a genetic female born with a Y chromosome, so maybe XXY, or an extra X chromosome. So, um, and, and for male, um, XY, or maybe um, X with um, missing part of the uh, sex chromosome. And so there's all of these different combinations. It's not black and white. I think that's what I was trying to get at. It's not just this or that. There is always exceptions to the rule, even when it comes to our physiology. Now, um, before we go on, I just wanna say one thing about intersex. One of the more common um, um, unwanted outcomes of intersex is an inability to reproduce. So oftentimes people have no idea that they uh, have an unusual combination of sex chromosomes. Number one, it's extremely um, uncommon, but oftentimes it doesn't show up in any way that's significant except the inability to conceive a child. So very interesting ideas here. Even when it comes to biology, nothing is black and white. All right, another important biological influence on sex is puberty. We talked about puberty briefly in the lifespan development module. And what I wanna focus on briefly is the idea that puberty is a biologically influenced process, you know, changing hormones that occur over years. But puberty brings about two broad changes. The, and I guess um, to begin, of course, you have sexual maturity. You know, after puberty, you can actually have sex and reproduce. And you also have growth, body change. But when it comes to these changes, psychologists break them into two different types. You have the primary sex characteristics and the secondary sex characteristics. And when it comes to the secondary sex characteristics, we're gonna break that apart even further. So first and foremost, primary sex characteristics refer to the development of the reproductive organs. In other words, the primary changes are those that allow the individual to reproduce. You are sexually mature thanks to the primary sexual characteristics. 
But puberty also brings about these secondary sex characteristics. These are things that might involve bodily change, but are not necessarily important for reproduction, or at least they're not necessary for reproduction. So an example would be body hair. Um, like, like men can grow a beard after puberty, or armpit hair, or pubic hair. These are known as secondary sex, sex characteristics. So body hair, for example, it's not necessary for reproduction. Obviously, you can shave your entire body, and that wouldn't prevent you from you know, being able to have a child necessarily. So why do they exist? Evolutionary psychologists argue that secondary sex characteristics, they might not be necessary for sex, but they might increase the likelihood of successful mate selection. So when it comes to body hair, some research has shown that, um, you know, like our pubic hair, it traps scent molecules and therefore it gives off um, an indication to a potential mate about our health status. You know, is that a healthy individual or not? This is probably much more relevant for non-human animals. And that's why you see a picture of a peacock. When a peacock um, is, is sexually mature, not only um, do they go through these changes in terms of primary you know, maturity of the reproductive organs, but they also develop these secondary sex characteristics. And one prime example is the peacock's feathers. So imagine you are a female peacock and you are looking around, you know, you're, you're looking for a mate and you see, um, you know, some options, but one of your options is this male peacock that is developed, that is displaying these gigantic, beautiful, brilliantly colored feathers. From an evolutionary standpoint, what that probably indicates is strength and vitality. In other words, the female is probably looking at that and saying, you know, wow, not only do you have enough energy to find food and avoid predators, but you also have enough energy left over to growing these brilliant feathers. Therefore, you must have what it takes to successfully reproduce with me and take care of my offspring. So it's an indication of, you know, the likelihood of mating successfully. So we definitely have these things as humans as well. And that's something we share with all animals is these primary and secondary sex characteristics. Another example of a secondary sex characteristic out in nature would be a lion's mane. You know, a lion, a male lion can have this really big bushy mane. And that probably signals to females, hey, I'm a really strong and vital mate. You should, you know, you should pick me. Here's what's important though. Humans are probably one of the only animals that has secondary sex characteristics that are culturally influenced. And one of the most obvious examples is clothing. There is nothing biological about clothing, but it is part of our sexuality, at least it can be. In other words, think of like um, a woman wearing a red dress. That might be considered romantic or sexy, but that is completely culturally specific. In other words, in Western cultures, we see movies where the female protagonist, um, if she's playing a romantic lead character, she might be dressed in a red dress. And so we learn that association. So these culturally influenced secondary sex characteristics are learned. Therefore, if you grow up in a non-Western culture, a red dress might not be considered romantic or sexy at all. It might have nothing to do with sex for you because it's all about social influence. So what are some other examples of culturally influenced secondary sex characteristics? Well, clothing is an obvious one, but what about makeup? Uh, that's another example of where you, you're kind of manipulating the way you look, in a sense, artificially. I mean, nothing wrong with makeup, but it's, it's a cultural phenomenon. It doesn't have not much to do with biology, except for maybe it accentuates one's biology. Uh, you could also argue that tattoos and piercings are examples of these culturally um, influenced secondary sex characteristics. The idea that uh, there are these cultural artifacts that play a big role in our likelihood of connecting with other people for oftentimes reproductive purposes. 
Uh, let's see, other examples would be money, for example. How much money you make would be a secondary sex characteristic. These are, you know, going beyond biological influence because that's something that kind of, again, is one of the themes in this module is that human sexuality is not just biological like the other animals. You know, we are biopsychosocial creatures. We are far beyond instinct. We go, you know, to learned behaviors to a much more complex degree than other animals. Okay, um, kind of a, you know, very much changing the subject, but still talking about human sex from a biological standpoint and puberty. This is the abstract of an article, a scientific article that was published in the 90s, and it's called Recollections of Spermarchy, an Exploratory Investigation. The word spermarchy refers to first ejaculation for males. Uh, first menstrual cycle for females is called menarche. But this was um, a study that surveyed 412 adult men about their experience when they were going through puberty. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it gets at this idea that puberty is something that inherently is totally biological. But there's this relationship with our culture, our biology and our society are, you know, bound, they're intertwined. And so what is the relationship between them when it comes to uh, spermarchy? So some, some really interesting things pop out at me. So the first is that usually these men told no one it had occurred. In other words, when they were boys going through puberty and they had their first ejaculation experience, the average person did not talk about it to their, you know, their parents, for example. Why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think it is that something that is so natural is not discussed openly in the average family? Maybe that's something you can answer on your own. Next, um, following this event, they tended to be moderately happy. All right, so maybe there's a sense of you know, satisfaction of feeling more grown up. Uh, they were very surprised, however. Another finding that I think is important. Maybe um, you know, if, if parents were more upfront about what to expect, boys going through this experience wouldn't be as surprised. And I should, I should mention that the research surveying women going through puberty is almost identical, that there's a lack of communication in Western cultures about, you know, these basic natural processes. All right. Finally, um, going through the process, these men um, reflecting on their past, they believed that, I mean, they, they felt like they did not hurt themselves. So maybe that's it. You know, maybe that's this idea that because it is natural and the individual can understand that it's a normal thing by themselves, maybe that's why people tend not to be as open about sex as, um, as the research suggests. So continue on because there is still much to consider when it comes to human sexuality from not only a biological perspective, but also a psychological and sociocultural perspective.